Sam told me last night that uh, that was the first full moon on Halloween since World War II. Amen. So uh, the, evolu- the, the world is revolving. It keeps moving. Amen. Hallelujah. So are you comfortable? One of the things I enjoyed about last night was not just the kids, but the young people I saw. And I say to those that are ministering to our kids and to our young people, sometimes Hollywood taints the way you think. Did you know that Simon Peter was probably 20 years old when he walked on water? That the other disciples were actually younger than him? That at the age of 13 to 15, you worked up under a, uh, a rabbi, and Jesus was, was considered a rabbi at age 30. That's why they called him Rabboni. So when you think of that, you realize that he actually has some teenagers with him, disciples, which, gives, which helps you understand some of the crazy things the disciples did, amen, and said. I think sometimes we, we wait till folk get uh, into a mature age to think somehow God can use them. That's not true. Amen. He using our young people. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. Just keep that in mind as you read through your scripture and see things. The reason I say Peter's probably the oldest, we know he was married because he had a mother-in-law. We know he talked about paying taxes. He didn't pay taxes till yet. He was 20, 21 years of age. And Jesus said, go, go catch a fish. James, don't you love that? Go catch a fish. He even opened his mouth, and there was a, a, a denara inside his mouth to pay taxes. And Jesus know where the money is. Amen. Well, you don't have to amen me on that. I just know that. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Slaves, well, I'll tell you, what a year we've had, huh? All the protests and rioting. I, I want you to be a little more kingdom-minded about things. Look what Paul said in the society of that day. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Forty years ago when I got born again, I read this, and and it shocked me that the Scripture talked about slavery. As a matter of fact, Paul is talking about real slavery, that they were men and women who were owned by masters. And he says to them, make sure you do in such a way that you live in such a way that you obey them to win their favor like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Verse 7, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. So he's telling the slaves, Make sure you treat your masters in such a way that you can win them. Because the issue is not here on this earth, but what you do here on this earth will matter in heaven. So how you do it. And then he turns around and gets on to the masters. And he says to the masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with them. So he tells the master, you better treat the slaves with dignity and not mistreat them. Because you know that you have a master in heaven. You know, as we begin to look at through this scripture, we think Bible and not think about society. As you look at the scriptures, they tell us unanimously that slavery within God's boundaries was not evil. It was not an evil of society, but it was a part of society. Biblical critics cry out. Man, I've read about them. I've heard about them even lately. Why doesn't Paul condemn slavery? Why doesn't Paul shout with all his breath that slavery is evil and sinful and that slave owners are unconverted, hell-bound sinners? The fact is he doesn't. The fact is Jesus doesn't. The fact is God of the Bible doesn't. All the way through Scripture, his own people were slaves for 400 years, the Israelites. And, so, and God did that in such a way to line them back out. So I thought I'd drop that bomb on you early. Amen. In this message, in hopes that it begin to sink in and that you'll have somewhat recovered by the time I get into 2 Timothy chapter 1 before we get into Philemon. But before we begin to look at our text, I want you to consider, and I want you to set in proper view of slavery and especially a view that will take us closer to our text. Here, more than ever, if we are to understand what we're fixing to read out of Scripture, in the times in which it was written, slavery was common in the ancient world. It was common. As a matter of fact, barring the abuses, it was a lot like an employee 
and employer in which we would see that today. Father, I thank you for your work. Open our hearts. Remove our prejudice, our racisms, the things that, that have been uh, put into our lives from parents and, and mentors around us. Help us understand biblically, Lord, what it's like to be kingdom-minded. In Jesus' name, and everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. Felt a little sweat coming. So might as well take that off now. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Paul speaking to, uh, to Timothy. He said, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesimus. Amen. For he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome... Remember, Paul ended up in Rome in prison. He sought me out very diligently, and he found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, and how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, you know very well. Onesimus, when I, when I read his name, who is this o Onesimus? Who is this guy? 2 Timothy 1, when I read out of the message, says, But God bless Onesimus for his family and many the, uh, many's the time I've been refreshed in that house. He wasn't embarrassed a bit that I was in jail. The first thing he did when he got to Rome was look me up. My, may God on the last day treat him as well as he treated me. And then there was all the help he provided in Ephesus. But you know that better than I. So when, I, when I'm reading this, I realize that Paul is talking about a man who helped him. As a matter of fact, he uses the phrase to him, he refreshed me. The Moffat translation said he braced me up. Weymouth said he cheered me. He sold me up. Mitchell said he sold me up. J.B. Phillips, I love reading about J. B., what J.B. Phillips says. He said he put a fresh heart in me. This is the kind of friend we're looking for. We're looking for, for an Onesimus that will put a fresh heart in us that doesn't look down on our chains our jail time or the times that, that we've been beat up amen uh, he looked for him and he found him when i read out of the book of philemon chapter 1 verse 10 paul again speaking he says i appeal to you for my child onesimus he said i'm pulling for this young man whom i have begotten in my imprisonment who formerly was useful to you but now is useful to you and to me. He was useless to you, but now is useful to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in, uh, back to you in person. That is sin in my very heart. For perhaps he was for this reason, separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord, if when you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me. But if he is wronged in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, I, I call this be Onesimus. When I read about this young man, Paul said he was not afraid of me. The background to this the book of Philemon is the story of a slave. Matter of fact, a slave by the name of Onesimus. The scripture, amen, begins to bear out that he was a runaway slave. Uh, one of the commentaries says Onesimus, a slave of Philemon, had run away, having evidently robbed his master. Chapter 1, verse 8, his travel somehow brought him to Rome, where in the providence of God, he came in contact with Paul. When I say providence, this is that thing when I walked in at the vet's office. It's just providence that I showed up at the right time, right place. Amen. And that idea. So this guy's a runaway slave. As a runaway slave, he finds Paul in Rome, and we read that when Onesimus in some way became useful to Paul, but Paul realized that Onesimus had a responsibility. In other words, they begin to talk. He said, well, you know, the truth of the matter is, Paul, I'm, I'm a slave. Philemon was my master. I ran away from him. Amen. I know I'm in a little bit of trouble here. So Onesimus was a very fortunate man. At one time, uh, being a, a slave, he stole. Also, somebody brought that out. But now an accepted, beloved brother. How many realize that as you're reading this story, you start seeing yourself in it. I mean, let me bring it out to you. First, he's a, he gets an undeserved substitute. Amen. In other words, Paul said, uh, if he's done anything wrong, I got it. I got his back. I'll look after it. And that's what Jesus did for us. We didn't deserve the substitute of Christ, but he took care of us. Second, an unpayable debt. All of us have sinned. And third, an unbelievable payment, which is the cross. Now, as I break this down to you, I want you to catch it. An undeserved substitute. Philemon chapter 1 verse 17. If you count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Or if then you regard me as a partner, 
Accept him as you would me. Paul begins his discourse with his condition. The stipulation seeks to find a common ground that is regarding Paul as a partner in the faith. So he looks at Philemon and he says, you know what? I know you're mad at this guy. I know that he was a slave. I know he ran away from you. It looks as if he stole from you. But I want you to know something. Amen. If you count me as a partner, receive him as myself. The word partner there is the word kononoos, which we get the word kononia, comes out of it. It's a fellowship, a partnership based on a common life. In other words, Paul's throwing it out there like this. If you love Jesus like I love Jesus, then you're going to accept this guy back. If you are really born again and saved and been forgiven, I want you to know something, my friend, that you want to bring this fellow back in your life. In his heart and mind, Philemon most certainly regarded Paul as a partner. After all, it was Paul who led Philemon to Christ. Philemon owes his eternity to a young man named Paul who led him to Jesus. Amen. It was Paul who refers to Philemon in the opening sentence as a beloved brother, a fellow worker. He was indeed a partner with him, a fellowship of faith. We got this koinonia together. Understanding that condition is met, that is Philemon recognizes Paul as a partner. Then the result of the condition is accept him as you would me. If you love me, then you're going to accept him. I, I love when brothers and sisters have such a connection with one another that they say, listen, I'm going to send somebody to you, and if you love me, you're going to love him. I've done that before to help guys get jobs. I, I was offered a, a, a job in youth ministry years ago, and I, and I told the guy, listen, if you love me, you'll love my friend. Amen. And some of you don't even know the story. I won't go into it because it may expose the love that I actually have for people. But I brought a man onto this, into this area because I said, and that was it. If you love me, you're going to love this guy. Amen. That's what Paul is saying to Philemon. If you love me, if you care about me, I want you to love Onesimus. I want you to bring him back. I want you to forgive him as you would forgive me. Thus, Philemon was standing there looking at Onesimus. He was, he was uh, to see the face of the apostle Paul. If you're looking at him, you're looking at Paul. Jesus takes our place. And this is the analogy. You can't lose this, my friend. Amen. Jesus appeals to the Father on our behalf. Jesus said, hey, if you want to see David, Look at my face. You want to see Joseph? Look at my face. I am the substitute for them. The word is atonement. Everybody say atonement. Amen. This is that revelation you catch as, as a believer in Christ. Atonement is the true meaning to Christ's death for me. Sacrificed himself in the place of us. Amen. In the place uh, we were condemned. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul described it in, to the Galatian believers, amen, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. So first, we have an undeserved substitute. I didn't deserve Jesus. You didn't deserve Jesus. But we accept Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. We were like that runaway slave. And again, here's Christ standing before the Father saying, Look, I'm standing on his behalf, a substitute. Second, un unpayable debt. Paul said in Philemon 1.18, But if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Now, I know many of you didn't. You, some of you older folk may come up with an account. I had a running account at Miss Ruby's store when I was a kid. Amen. If I got an orange juice and a, and a, and a three musketeer, put it on my account. It's one of them cool things at 12 years of age. Amen. You don't get that anymore. Folk just don't do that. They call it credit card now. Uh huh. But back in the day, they just wrote that down on a little pad, and you just you know you had to pay. Well, Paul said the same thing here. Charge that on my account. Onesimus had incurred a debt. Amen. A debt which he could not pay. He would never be able to repay it. Amen. He owed Philemon. It was a monetary debt. And we know that Onesimus was a runaway slave. The price of a good servant, amen, in 60 AD was 500 denarii. That would be the equivalent to almost a year and a half of a free man's wages. Almost an impossible amount for a free man at that time to save, let alone a slave. So he owed this huge debt to, to Philemon. In addition, it is apparent that Onesimus stole possessions or money from Philemon possibly to fund his escape. So here he is. He's escaped. He's incurred a second debt, not just a first one run as a slave, but a second debt, which he couldn't repay. Amen. The penalty for that was death. So I read the scripture that the wages of sin is death. So I look and realize that we, we have this unpayable debt in our own lives. I can't pay this debt. I can't do enough good things. I can't be kind enough to others to pay the debt that is on my life in order to secure me to heaven. Amen. So Onesimus couldn't either. So no matter how long he toiled or how good he was, Onesimus had broken the law. Justice demanded his life. It could only be satisfied by his death. 
It's a very bleak picture. Yet, that is the exact picture that you and I got, amen, and all of humankind faces. This is the word we got to get out to people. You know, I'm concerned about people coming back to church, but I'm more concerned about reaching folk that are on the preface of hell, amen, on their way there. Somebody's got to reach them. Somebody's got to tell them, you know, you got a debt you can't pay. Amen. But you got a substitute that'll step in for you if you'll accept it. Amen. That's all you got to do is this. Amen. And like Onesimus, amen, he stepped up. He began to learn the debt which, which God placed as a penalty for disobedience was more than physical death. It's this thing, you know, if I just died physically, that's okay. If I knew, if I knew that through the word of God, that if I just died, I died. That'd be one thing. But to know that when I was born, there was a spirit inside of me, amen, that's going to live forever somewhere. And that God gives new bodies to those that go into the, uh, into the kingdom of God, amen. Then I start realizing that death is not the end of anything. It is a transition. It's a moving from one place to the other. And I want to make sure, by the way, let me just get this straight to help you understand. The scripture teaches that everybody's going to heaven. Everybody going to heaven. Everybody. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Everybody. Go. You mean my unsaved, uh, abusive grandpa's going to heaven? Yes, he's going to heaven. But he's not going to get to stay. The scripture says when you get there, God's going to separate the goat from the sheep. Right to the left. The righteous and the unrighteous. Those covered by the blood. Those that accepted him and those that didn't. Amen. Are you follow me? I know I just can't condemn somebody's grandpa. Please, I'm don't, I don't know nothing about your grandpa. I was talking about mine, all right? So just let it go. But I read here that spiritual death is the separation of the soul from God, the separation of the creature from the creator. Amen. You know, that, that God created us, and now we're going to be separated from him. Romans 6, again, the wages of sin is death. Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, so death spread to all because all have sinned. You think that virus spreads? Look how sin spreads. Oh, it spreads quickly. Oh, you know, the Bible says it passed down from daddy to daddy to daddy to daddy. It, father to son, father to son, father to son. It's like, it, you know, God bless mama. She's just, she's pretty pure in all this. But us men, we get spanked for this thing, man. Because it just, our stubbornness is passed down. Our lustfulness is passed down. Our, 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 our anger is passed down. Things that we've done, it's passed down. It's just like it's virus. It's easily caught. So that's what it says here in the Scripture. And so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin is missing the mark. It's missing. It's, it's, it's taking aim and missing. You missed it. Uh, you missed the mark of perfection, holiness, a mark that we all have missed. We, we all missed it. And like Onesimus, my goodness, he, he, a lawbreaker under the death sentence, a penalty of death, a death that we could not pay. And when I'm reading what Paul's saying here, he's saying Onesimus, Onesimus, you need to go back to Philemon. First off, you need to go back to him. I want to tell you, thank you, that I was in jail and in chains, and you refreshed me. You happened to walk in when I needed you the most. You're not the same guy. I, he, I led you to Jesus, and Jesus transformed your life, and you realize that as a slave, that everything about you has changed in you. Now that you refresh me, I'm asking you for restitution to go back to this man called Philemon. And then he sends a letter to Philemon. When I read it, he says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Chapter 1, verse 18. Paul's custom was to dictate it. You know, like I preach, and then Cheryl writes and tells you what I preached. Uh-huh, if you read her, her blogs. I mean, she's always telling you what I preached. So that was important. But Paul gets to the end. He said, no, no, no. I'm going to sign this check. I'm going to make sure that Philemon understands that Onesimus has refreshed me, blessed me. And, and listen, by the way, Philemon, if you don't understand this yet, the only reason that, that God's on your side is because, I, do I have to tell you that it's because of my preaching? Do I have to tell you it's because of my testimony that you were even born again? Okay, I'm not going to tell you that. Read it. That's the way Paul talks. It's like some of y'all on social media, y'all crack me up. I mean, I read people's stuff that go, uh, uh, you know, you can gossip all you want, gossip will never hurt me, yada, 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 because I don't care what you think. Well, hold on. If you don't care what they think, why'd you write all that up there? Are you following where I'm going here? Amen. And this is, what, this is what Paul's saying here to Philemon. He said, you know what? I don't have to bring up the fact that you owe everything you got to me. I don't have to bring that up, so I won't. 
That's what Paul throw down right there. Amen. He lays it out. So, so the custom was, to, Paul's custom was to dictate the letter. But here, he's writing the closing greeting with his own hand. He wants to make the point very clear. I will repay it. Amen. Just know this. I'll take care of this guy. Paul accepts completely whatever debt Onesimus has incurred. Amen. In his robbery and in his subsequent flight. Amen. Paul was so concerned about reconciliation that he would pay the price. Amen. And that's what Jesus did for you. That's what Jesus did for me. Amen. That he paid the price. Because of his great love and desire for us to be reconciled, he paid the ultimate price. You know why I worship, amen, the way I do? It's because I realize I don't deserve the grace and the mercy, the air I breathe, the blessing I've got in my life. Amen. But he's so good to me. Hallelujah. He reconciled me. He blessed me. 1 Peter 1.18 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of jesus a lamb without blemish or defect amen he was chosen before the creation of the world but was revealed in these last times for your sake through him you believe in god who raised him from the dead and glorified him and so your faith and hope are in god amen there is you know when i read this he not only nullified the dead but he imparted righteousness to me he didn't say hey okay uh, i'm going i'm going to get you. no no i'm going to make you right Right means I'm right standing with God. Amen. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Because I can't, God ain't going to let me in unless I'm right. And Jesus said, right, 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 right. I'll make you right. Amen. When, when God looks at you, he sees me. Hallelujah. And I read this and I realize, my goodness, not only is your debt transferred, amen, and righteousness is fully transferred. It's one of those things you don't have to accept it, but it happened. It's so sacrificial. Amen. The debt, the eternal debt, the spiritual and the physical separation is paid in full. Jesus went to the cross. Were we not all slaves to sin? Well, did not sin call you and you beckoned and went and did whatever sin was calling you to do? And even though you even fight it right now and you still struggle with it, you, you, but, but you have to keep fighting with it. Amen. You can't quit fighting with it. But eventually you get free from it. Amen. That's what God does in your life. Romans 3, 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement at one moment. Made us one through faith in his blood. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Paid in full. When Jesus died on the cross, when he said, it is finished. Amen. He didn't say, I'm finished. It's finished. What was he talking about? Atonement. Amen. A new destiny, a new identity, a new uh, eternity, a new creation in Christ. We don't have proof. However, by the simple fact. That it's in the scripture, I have to believe it. It's one of those things, I can't prove it, you can't disprove it. But I believe in all my heart that Onesimus went back to Philemon. And I got some glimpses that I picked up on, amen, as I, as I moved through scripture. And we never know about the consequences that will take place as a result of acting in a way that honors Christ. In church history, we may have caught a glimpse of this runaway slave 40, 50 years after his return to the master. The story goes that Ignatius... And, you know, you can read um, several of, I'm trying to think of this one guy, uh, Joseph, no, no, Joseph, I'll get it later. Who? Not, not Jehoshaphat, but there's, there's, a, there's a historian that wrote that people look at, it's not scripture, it's the history. Josephus, thank you, sir. Josephus wrote about it. So when you read it, 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 it comes back to you to realize that so many of the Bible that's written, these guys were witnesses to it. So it goes that Ignatius, one of the great Christian martyrs, which means he died for his faith, is being taken to be executed from Antioch, his church, to Rome, just like Paul. As he goes, he writes letters which still survive to the churches of Asia Minor. He stops at Smyrna, and he writes to the church at Ephesus. And in the first chapter of the letter, he has much to say about their wonderful bishop, the head of the church, the pastor. And what's the bishop's name? It's Onesimus, the runaway slave. And Ignatius makes exactly the same pun as Paul made he says onesimus by name and onesimus by nature the profitable one to christ 
Do you think God saved you so you could be unprofitable? I think God wants, and forgive me if this sounds crude, but he wants to squeeze all of the goodness and life out of you before you leave here. So he says to slaves, honor your master. Live in such a way that they want to come back to Christ. And masters, don't abuse the slaves. And, he's, and again, in our day, he's talking about employees and employers. But people, listen, when you go Old Testament, you'll re realize that some of the slaves, they didn't want to leave their master. They would take an a ice pick, an awl, and get up to the doorpost of the home they were in. And the master would run it through their ear. It was a piercing of their ear. And when you saw a slave like that, it meant he was free to go, but he chose to stay. Now, I'm not going to pierce my ear, but I'm going to tell you, he pierced his hands. Yeah. Amen. And he, as a substitute, amen, he sat in for me. I, an undeserved substitute. I didn't deserve him. Amen. An unpayable debt. I could never pay. From the, for the sins in my life, I could never pay them. I could never do it. But his blood did it. An unbelievable payment. That he'd be on the cross and they would shove vinegar to his mouth. They beat him. Amen. And all the things that, that I read about the end of the life of Christ. And I think to myself, Paul, that's what you were saying. That you'd be that for this man. Amen. That his life would be changed. There's, there's an old song I remember from years ago. He said he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus, the dead is gone. Amen? Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Whatever debt of sin that is owed to the Father, I'm here to tell you that Jesus paid the price. I'm also here to tell you that we move from slaves to sons and daughters. That at one time, we were a slave. We were a servant. But we, we serve now out of love and appreciation for the gift of Christ in our life. I want you to know that this morning, if you watch online, if you're here in person, that the story of Philemon, the story of Onesimus, is the story of Christ in us. Our world needs redemption. This time next week, we'll either have the same and better or a different president. We don't know what's going to happen within a week. Our economy could crash. There could be riots and pandemonium. But what our world needs is a dose of the gospel. And I don't mean that sugary. I mean to tell you that we were all born in slavery. We were all born in debt. We all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous outside of Christ. God help us. Help us to share the redemptive story of Jesus. With a world that's going to hell. And is so full of anger. Over past generations. That actually. <laughs> God we could all play the victim. Forgive us of our sins. Change us and turn us around. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be Onesimus. Remind yourself that you were a slave. You were a slave to sin. I know some of you say, well, Pastor, I still struggle with it. That's right, you struggle with it. There was a day you didn't struggle with it. You just gave in to it. Amen. Keep on struggling. Keep on fighting. Amen. Keep on believing. I'm going to stand on this book. Amen. Amen. We have an undeserved substitute, an unpayable debt, an unbelievable payment. He paid it all. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, if you need prayer for your body, would you stand? If you just need prayer for your body, would you stand? Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. See, one thing I, I really believe in is that I need this body to work until God takes me home. 
whatever age that is. I just need his body to work. Just keep right on working. Amen. I need my hands working. I need my body working. You know, uh, my, my father-in-law is 87, fixed to be 88. He's still kicking, fixing to have surgery to give him more time. Amen. As long as, as, long as you here on this earth, there's purpose in your life. There's something God wants you to do. Amen. He got something for you. There's somebody next to you. Put a hand on, on Frank there. Put a hand on Donald. Put a, put a hand on your wife there. Amen. Reach out and touch one another right here. Amen. Somebody get Keith. Well, step over there by, and put hands on him too because he, he needs healing too. Amen. Get a hand on my sister over here. Amen. Somebody put a hand on her right here. Somebody get a hand on my sister here. Father, in Jesus' name, the name above all names, God, I stand knowing that you took our sin. But not only that, when they beat your back, you took our healing. God, and you said by your stripes we were healed. So we're going to stand in the beloved, in the, in the blood of Christ, amen, covering our sins, knowing that the beating you took, the abuse that you went through, you are a substitute for us for a payment we couldn't pay. So, God, we stand believing that we're healed. We call out right now to you, Jesus, heal our bodies. Jesus, heal our bodies. Jesus, heal our bodies. Give us wisdom, God, to move forward. Whatever genetics we came into this world with, God, we pray in Jesus' name, you reverse that and make us more like you. I thank you for healing. Now, touch our minds and drive depression from us. Take away the clouds and the darkness that would try to take away our memories. God, we bless this house in Jesus' name. We stand on our healing. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. November 8th, we have the TLCC Ladies Retreat Registration. Sign up only available for one more week. Please sign up and register now at the registration table in the back of the church. See Lucinda or Miss Cheryl for details. Uh, now through November 15th is Tayden's Pantry Food Ministry. Time to buy some groceries to help out our food pantry with goods from Thanksgiving blessing boxes. We just want to be able to bless our people. You know, anybody that might need them in this time. And if you know somebody that's going to need this, please let us know. We can't help them if we don't know. Uh, and that's going to be uh, the grocery list. This is buy some groceries on the list. Bring groceries to the church next Sunday. It's that easy. Food will be distributed on Sunday, November 22nd for Thanksgiving. Um, uh, that's a, I, is it, Miss Lucinda, do you see a list in the back? I don't know if they're supposed to get that to Does anyone know? Oh, we're out of them? Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to make sure. I, I don't know if it's online or not. I don't want to lie to nobody. Um, but um, I, I, I will tell them. What's that? Uh, Lo, Lori posted it on her page, her Facebook page. So look up Miss Lori. She's got it on her Facebook page. Um, that will really, really help us out. Uh, November 3rd and through in November 11th, um, vote and pray. Okay. All right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we need both of those things. Pray for our country. Vote by November 3rd. Pray for our veterans. Um, for Veterans Day is November 11th. Uh, H, is there anything you want to say about that? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, it just, just it says pray for our country, vote, and that, you know, it, and that ties in with prayer. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Again, I, I will reiterate what Pastor always says, um, and that's uh, we we vote for life, okay, in this house, and we're Bible believing. We vote for life. Yeah. First week, midweek, uh, bring the youth. Anybody you know that's that age, bring them out. We're going to hang out. Uh, also, the adults are going to be meeting in here with Pastor. Um, excited about the next season of this church, you know, and see where we're going to go. See what's going to look like. You know, the truth is, yeah, the future is unknown, but it's always been unknown. That's the reality. Does it look ugly? Could. And it, there's also hope. So, you know, and the fact is our, our hope is not Donald Trump. Our hope is not Joe Biden. Our hope is Jesus. And so we have to remember that. 
Uh, we're going to keep believing and keep trusting that Jesus is bigger than anything that this world can dish out. Amen. And so we're going to keep believing for our, our, our God and we're going to keep praying for our president. November 3rd and 4th, it's going to be the first week, midweek. Come celebrate with us. Hang out. It's really just a big, that's what it's all about. It's about hanging out. It's about fellowshipping. It's about sharpening one another. December 12th, it's going to be our hobo Christmas. Save the date. Join in on the fun. Bring soups, stews, chilies, dumplings, desserts, etc. I believe it's going to be in New Caney, but it doesn't say on here, so, and it doesn't say on there, so, yeah, I'm like 80, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with what Joseph said, 80% sure we're going to be in New Caney. Um, last year it was here, but I do believe that uh, we're going to be in New Caney this year, uh, and again, that's, that's, that's what it's all about, it's about just hanging out, just having fun, that's what it's always been about. They called it hobo because they, in the beginning it was cold. They dressed up, they just wore pajamas, whatever, and then they bring soups and stews and whatever. So that's what it's always been about, just hanging out, getting ready for the Christmas season, enjoying one another. Um, and and the big thing is uh, hopefully by then our freezers will be full of deer and pigs and everything else. Maybe you guys will get to enjoy some of the fruits of others' labors, okay? So uh, that'll be a good time. Huh? Yeah, I no. I'm saying I'm saying you can enjoy the fruit of my labor, though. See, you didn't have to go do it, but you got to enjoy the fruit of it. So yeah, that's what we're hoping for: full freezers and full bellies. Amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you today. I thank you for the gift and the giver in this house. I pray that you would bless every single person in here and that you would continue just to prosper the kingdom of heaven. And Lord, we love you. We thank you. We're so grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget about pastor's bucket in the back. Let's bless our pastor today. Let's show him that we love him. Amen. Today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Y'all have a blessed week. We love you.